the old fern books date back to Victorian times and beyond, when fern hunting and collecting was a great craze. In 1891, the British Trilogical Society was founded, which makes this their centenary year, fittingly at a time when ferns are seeing a great resurgence in popularity. Ferns were mostly taken from the wild, which of course is something we shouldn't be doing today, and indeed needn't do, because they're quite readily available from nurseries and garden centres. But it does help to notice how ferns grow in the countryside, because this gives valuable clues as to where they should be positioned in the garden. I think, apart perhaps from bracken, which we certainly don't want to talk about, um, one of the most easily recognisable ferns is possibly the male fern, Dryopteris felix mass which likes to grow in slightly shady, moist places. Preferences it shares with the pretty lady fern, Ethereum felix femina. But there are, of course, ferns for really difficult places in the garden. They can tolerate a wide range of conditions. Take the heart's tongue fern, Asplenium scolopendrium. That can grow in really dark caves where there's just a little chink of light shining through. And it can also grow in quite sunny places, but tolerates dry soil. This is also true of the soft shield fern, Polysticum sativum. so both of these are very good for those awkward places under trees where there's shade and also dry soil with competition from tree roots. Polypodiums like a little bit more light than under the dense shade of a tree, and it can often be found in association with castle walls. If you go to see old ruined castles, if they're limestone, which is what they like, you'll often find the polypodiums growing there. We've come to the home of Hazel and Martin Rickard in Herefordshire, and they're modern day fern enthusiasts. Martin has over 70 different sorts of polypodiums. We've got a national collection of polypodiums, and that's one of about 20 different national collections of ferns, which are spread amongst members of the British Trilogical Society. You've got more polypodiums than I think I've ever seen. Are there any particular favourites of yours? Perhaps this one here, Granisette's Foster very heavily crested form that was first found in the Lake District in about 1870. We thought that was extinct, but fortunately we've still got it. Or perhaps the most famous variety in polypodium, or group of varieties, the plumose form, Polypodium australi cambricum. We've got an example here. This variety was first discovered in South Wales in, in 1668, 323 years ago. Amazing. And all of these polypodiums have only just produced their fronds. And how long do the fronds last until? Well, they'll go through till May, probably, in super form. And even in frosty weather, they can be very attractive in their own right. And with the particles of frost on the edge of the leaves, it's a, it's a very nice effect. But the leaves do tend to curl over in very severe frost. And then when the frost goes, it's back out again. Perfect. What impresses me, looking at your entire collection of ferns, is the sheer number of varieties that exist just under one type of fern. Well, towards the end of the Victorian period, there's one particular book published that listed 1,861 cultivars of British ferns. And some species had three to 400 cultivars described. I think my favourites are possibly the heart's tongue fern. Are there any particularly good varieties amongst oh, those? Oh, yes. Well, the Asplenium scolopendium crispum Bolton's nobly, brilliant, brilliant variety. That was discovered in the Lake District in about 1900, 1910, somewhere around there. The sterile form doesn't produce any spores and it has to be propagated by division. But there are other forms which come from spore, and here you've got um, a brachiate cristate variety, which is uh, a bit of a mouthful, but quite attractive in its own way. Now this is a special one here, and this, this is Ethereum felix femina plumosum dreary, a variety of our native British lady fern. And it's one that was raised towards the, latter, the, the end of the last century by Drury, a very good fern man of the time. And he offered a plant of that to Queen Victoria and she graciously accepted. Now we come to one of my special favourites, Anne. Oh, well, I never expected to see tree ferns in, the, in Herefordshire. Well, it is a bit, a bit of a surprise. This, this is Dixonia antarctica, the Australian tree fern. And I must admit, I do have to cheat to grow it here. They are in the ground. I don't take them in or anything, but I do build a wall of straw bales around them in the middle of winter. One of these plants I brought up from Cornwall about five years ago, and another one from Kerry in Ireland four years ago. And we got another one from Kerry last week on holiday, which is up in the nursery tunnel. The nursery is run by Martin's wife, Hazel. Most of her plants are propagated from spores she collects from ferns in the garden. 
You can tell when spores are ripe because they're held in structures called sporangia, found on the backs of the fronds. These turn a shiny black colour when they're ripe, usually around about July and August. So take the frond off then and place in an envelope, and within about three days, the fine dust-like spores will be released from the sporangia. You can then sow them onto sterilised compost and wait for the first stage, which are the liverworts like prothalli. After a while, true fronds appear and small clumps can be pricked out with tweezers and then finally separated into small ferns. Hardy ferns are easy to grow and are relatively maintenance free. Most will thrive in any soil, but do check before you plant because one or two of them like an acid soil. Generally, it pays to mulch around them in spring with well-rotted compost, as this will improve the structure of the ground and to an extent will help with moisture retention. I only grow two or three different ferns in my garden, but now I've seen how beautiful and versatile Hazel and Martin's plants are, I really want to expand my collection. Elegant and atmospheric, now I can see why the Victorians were so besotted with them. Thank you.